uh, and and also actually uh, for me it's it sounds a bit like how say hypocritic hypocritical yes hypocritical uh I mean to to be uh, to fight so much with 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 like Japan over this issue, uh, while uh, while in in Korea uh, women are still there are so many women still like in prostitution and it's not it's not that they they choose it to have like an e easier life it's for them some of them they they uh, work in prostitution just to get uh, like money for their university because if they basically don't graduate from university their position in the in the society is very low right as, as far as i know if you don't graduate from university people will kind of look down on you they won't uh, really respect you so um so okay. yes yeah, so uh, basically i said that the government uh, instead of just focusing i don't mean that this is completely not important i'm not saying just to to forget about the thing the thing i'm saying is they should try to change the the reality in korea now which is kind of i would say sh maybe shameful a bit for Korea if you look of how much like also how, how Kore Korean government actually like encouraged prostitution to help the economy of Korea so uh, on one hand they encourage the women to 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 go into prostitution and on the other hand you criticize Japan for what they did so but basically women are still the praise of the whole situation before I um, mean during the war and after the war as well so it was su su for some of them. It was the only way to survive and to support their families. Uh, so that's that's why they went into that. It's not like their own choice. It, it, so I would say that th this is uh, mm, this is not well. This also not ethical of uh, government to, of, of a state to encourage women to go into their prostitution. So, mm. That's fine. I was very proud of Emily for reading the whole book. Sell yourself to help your family. 
okay? But today, would that be considered legal? Can, if you're a fisherman, can you buy Emily and shoot? Yes or no? No, it's not legal. Would it be considered moral to buy Emily and throw her to the sea? No, so today is neither legal nor moral, okay? But back then it was fine, and it wasn't even considered immoral, okay? And so if you read like the, you know, if you read like, like, you know, like 13th, 14th century Korea, my ancestors, Joseon Shide, okay? Um, so, you know, they asked women to go to <coughs> China as tributes. It's basically, you know, as sex workers, right? Mm -hmm. But then for the women, it's not like, you didn't have the sense of individual consent, okay? Because if you're a true daughter, you have to what? It's your duty to what? Yes, to, to uh, like be obedient to... Right, you need to obey. You need to obey your parents, you need to obey, you need to serve your family, you need to serve the government, right? Who read chapter 6? Yeah. And then chapter 6 was less like public sex, okay? Mm -hmm. The role of the government. And if you read chapter 6 and also other chapters, many women actually consider it was their patriotic duty to help the government. Because don't forget, Korea was a colonial, Korea was a colony of Japan. So the government was Japan, right? So many women, both Korean and Japanese, uh, it was my duty to serve as comfortable women, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that, you know, so maybe some, maybe not all, but probably some women in the 13th century also felt that it was my duty to go to China, okay? Otherwise, the Chinese army would invade and ravage Korea, okay? And then I'm sure some women also thought it was a patriotic duty in the 1950s and 60s to serve as comfort women with American soldiers. Okay. And so I guess my point is that you know a lot of a lot of these like a lot of the discussion today is very ahistorical. Okay? You cannot you know you cannot use today's standards to you know, to to judge what people did in the old days. Okay. Yes. And then we can learn from the past, and hopefully we're never do that again. Mm -hmm. But we can't just say like, "Oh, they're evil and they're doing evil things," mm -hmm. because the whole mentality was very different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yeah, but but, okay. but then based on that uh, of this culture, the culture, this is uh, that's why I'm saying this is uh, what do you call to uh, to blame Japan so much as it say it is it, as it shares the same culture. Yeah. That's fine. That's a fair argument. Okay. But uh, I mean. Well, it, when I actually when I read this 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 issue from there was uh, the, the Japanese uh, like uh, especially the nationalistic like the they didn't see this as a big problem. I mean, they didn't see from their perspective they didn't actually this is such a such a bad thing except for the fact that they took the foreign women. But uh, for them, they they just felt like they have to do this. They should do this. So I I saw it from a kind of more of uh, I would say like Asian culture perspective. So. Okay. But then that, that's why I'm saying that uh, well, like Korean government is well is using it for like uh, just um, maybe to get some benefits like nowadays uh, like in the relationship with, with Japan maybe. Right. Uh, but um, that's right. And then Sarah so explains like why some people might do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because like in the 1990s, you had the rise of this kind of dominant paradigm, mm -hmm. and then um, but it's not just Korea. Who read the Rolling Stones article? Virginia one. Okay, two, three, okay? Because we have a similar, we have a similar like dominant paradigm in American University, mm -hmm. which is that, you know, which is that when, you know, do you want to be man or woman? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to what? This is like role playing, okay? Okay. Okay, let's say like, mm -hmm. you know, let's say you're a woman mm -hmm. and you accuse me of what? Doing something bad, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. okay? So the, the, ra you know, the R word, right? Mm -hmm. right? And then I say, no, I didn't do bad thing to you. Mm -hmm. You know, we're both drunk, and just mm -hmm. things happen. Yeah. Okay, but I didn't force you to do anything you mm -hmm. didn't want to do. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, the question is, who do you believe, right? And then usually, like scholars or journalists, we have to like check both sides of the story. But the dominant paradigm in many American universities is that you know accusers never lie, or they rarely lie. Okay. And so if you believe in the dominant paradigm that accusers never lie, then it's only sufficient to get Emily's side of the story mm -hmm. and to publicize it. And that's what Rolling Stones did. Mm -hmm. They publicized Emily's story that she was raped by seven guys mm -hmm. at this one fraternity. So the university closed down the entire fraternity system. And 
then people vandalize the fraternity. Okay? And then later on, people, you know, they check other, other scholars, other journalists, they actually check the story. Mm -hmm. And they find out that, you know, a lot of, there's too many discrepancies. Mm -hmm. All the things that she said did not happen. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so, we don't know for sure, like, only Jack, the person's name was Jackie. Not Emily, right? So only only Emily or Jackie can know, that, you know, what really happened. Me and you know me and her. Okay. But it's a job of journalists and scholars to what? Yeah, to find the truth. Decide. Right, and also always find corroboration. Okay, you can't just say like it's an accusation, it's a claim. Whenever you hear, so you always need to support a claim with what? What? Right, supporting arguments and evidence. You know, why do you think he raped you? What is the evidence that he raped you? Mm -hmm. So you need both motivation and also like evidence, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of the, a lot of scholars, a lot of journalists today, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can it's I tell? Can I tell a very interesting thing I heard recently from my friend? Okay. Uh, in Korea, I don't know if it was one year or two years ago, there was a case um, of the, um, there was. Um, there were like people that got drunk, maybe on like some empty or something like that, and okay. uh, and um, the the girl, yes, and and then the girl, she no, the, the guy, the guy was trying to kiss the girl, and she uh, she just uh, bit his tongue, and he lost like okay. one third of his tongue or something, and then the older thing went to to the. Um, like it all went to the court, and and the the girl, the, the guy had to go. Um, no, the the girl was the first, and then the the girl tried to kiss the guy, and uh, and he like bit her uh, tongue, and then but nothing. But then they explained that well, well, she was drunk, and uh, like all the situation that uh, that wasn't such a big of, of a deal, and then the same story, actually very similar story, happened after a year or after two, like recently, and then. The the girl tr uh, then the guy tried to kiss the girl and she bit his. Uh, okay, I'm kind of confused. Whatever. I'm about this. <laughs> which happened first? Whatever. Anyway, in care in case of girl in case of girl there was like no problem and it's just uh, finished. Like there was she didn't have to she didn't have there was no consequence for the girl okay. and the guy went to prison for half a year and he had to pay very huge like fine. So and the story is, since the story is almost the same. I mean, it really shows like how, how people like in nowadays in Korea. If you are a woman, you are actually safe. I mean, kind of in, in any kind of this this kind of situation, because they they will okay they will believe that we have to protect the women now. I mean, because in Korea now you can look like for example in universities like they have special study rooms for girls. They have special. There are many things they're trying to like kind of maybe make it up for. Sure. So they are kind of like equal. Because and you're the yes, down. yes. But on the other hand, but then if there we ha if we have real equality in this kind of situation. They should be the the. I mean, it it should be similar. Why? No, I'm just I'm just thinking about this whole. This is, I think mm -hmm. it's I think of the French lady as well. Like in the French lady, I mean, in Korea was not until last year that it was legal to rape your wife. It, it is like that. So like. I don't know. I think it's always like you also like also definitions of rape. Like, what is a rape? Is it that uh, it's not clear, or is it like if you're a husband, you have the right to have sex with your wife, if it, even if she not wants that? Maybe that's not considered rape. Then even if I do that, so I'm just elaborate with. It's not the same. Consider the same thing everywhere, and I think it's when you wanna think about it for yourself, you should just think like, what do I think is right or wrong? I know, but I'm just I'm just saying that. It's the same situation, so they should have the same co the, the consequences for them, the, like the punishment should be same. Yeah, and that's what I'm wondering. Like, um, there must be a reason that one can, like, six because months prisons and the other not. Cause because uh, because I'm studying law, yes. I cannot believe that that is the only difference why one get this yes. and one get that. And of course, it's also depending on the defense well, and the FGATE and what yeah, claims you're making. Yes. But except for that, there must be other parts in the story. That's it's why I'm one asking you, no, like, what do you they know? Think they, they kind of explain why it, why they, uh, why the woman, uh, like, it was f in case of woman, it was self-defense, and they like, kind of maybe they thought that the guy could just use like the force, you know, kind of like to push her away, but well, 
when when you they were both like in both cases they were like drunk people and they were like asleep that, that's the thing they were asleep and somebody comes and kissing you you can do this just like maybe there is some that's actually kind of weird because I've never heard of such a story in Poland <laughs> nobody got <laughs> drunk and <laughs> bit somebody's right. tongue but well, maybe yeah. Chris do yes do you understand the story did you hear about the story she's saying she's saying like 남자가 취하면 they said it was her self-defense in case of girl, and the guy it was not self-defense. I don't know. I don't see the difference. It might be the self-defense. Yeah, but we actually talked about this before. Remember, like in Sweden, you know, women cannot be prosecuted, but men can, you know, for uh, prostitution. Um, so, or the buyer seller, but because of the gender know, distinction, right? I know. Okay. Um, but also, like, I think another interesting analogy between Rolling Stones and Korea is that victims or these accusations tend to be so, like, dramatized, right? And so it's like, it wasn't just like, you know, just a couple of guys were drunk and he does something bad to me. It was like seven people gang raped, okay? And then, like, Ricardo, when you went to the museum, it wasn't just kidnap, but it was like kidnap, murder, and cannibalism. Okay, and so one, these stories tend to be very dramatic, and two is that again nobody challenges it, so nobody challenged the woman's story at the Comfort Woman Museum, and Jackie, the woman in Virginia, she's been telling her stories at all these conferences, you know, in Virginia, and nobody challenged her because it's not you're not supposed to challenge her because she's a she's a victim, she's a rape survivor, right? Well, no, it was, no, it was, it's, it's more like an, it's more like an educational forum to educate students about, you know, rape on campus. And so, in that context, students, you know, you, you'd be very uncomfortable to challenge the testimony, okay? Because none of you challenged the harmonies when you went there, right? Why? But your, how about your scholarly instinct to challenge? <laughs> Not necessarily you're wrong, but but yeah, but but you can ask like Ricardo, like how, how do you know it was cannibalism? Did you see the cook? Shh. Okay, or maybe just or maybe somebody just misunderstood. Okay, you want to say something? Yeah, like, um, like hang on, there were a few cases where like um, women would be like, especially like girls, so like like mid teens, uh, mid twenties, sorry. Um, they claimed that they were raped and stuff, um, but they were actually penalised because they didn't come out um, and tell them, like, tell the police or whatever straight away. So, like, even though they were women, even though they were like females, um, this from was in what country was this? This is like back home. In England. Yeah. Okay. So, like, they were actually penalised, um, and the articles, like, I know it's obviously the media and stuff, but they made the women look like they were not lying, but maybe hiding something. That's why they didn't come out right at the beginning okay. and tell, which I. Was just That is true, but I any but focus on like your duty as scholars and journalists, right? So your duty is to like find you know, collaboration, evidence and find out actually what happened. Okay. Okay, Sky, you're next. Sky. Okay. <laughs> Did you get my feedback? Okay. Alright. So Sky worked hard and he wrote two essays for me. Okay, now, but Sky made a, you know, he did something that many students do, which is what? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you talked about the comfort woman, right? Right. Um, because basically what I find is that many students, they basically copy and paste, and then they, and then they, you know, they put their claim at the end. So don't like I quote Yeah, but you need like quotation marks. Okay? Like this is like Yeah, you don't have quotation marks. Okay. Uh, 
Anyway, okay. Maybe you can re uh, when you know for my class when you revise it. I don't want like two thirds of the paper to be like quotation. I want maybe less than one third to be quotation and two thirds to be your claim, your words. Okay? Because basically you had like you know, basically from here to here this is all quotation. Okay? And then you have a little discussion at the end. Okay? So I don't want that. Because you can, you know, if I wanna if I wanna read other people's articles, I can just go to the link. Okay? You know, this essay I wanna hear your claim, your argument, your evidence. Okay? That's point number one. And point number two is that you need to show me in your essay that you carefully did the class readings. So if you do the comfort women, uh, because I, I don't have I don't see any quotation or citation from the chapters in the comfort women. Okay, it seems like that you only read the advertising for the comfort women. So you need to show me that you actually read specific chapters. Okay, uh, and and the reason why I mention that is because again, like as a teacher, I try to find the best academic books with the highest standards. Because especially for very controversial issues like comfort women, most times you just get propaganda, okay? Or just or you just get lazy scholarship. You basically get books where all you do is get, you just get a bunch of testimonies from one side, in this case, comfort women, and you say that's the truth, and then anybody who challenges them are revisionists, okay? That's a very boring book. A more interesting book is like Comfort Woman from Sarasota where she lays out claims from all different sides and then she analyzes, okay? And then, and then she asks like, why did you say this in 1960 but then you change your story in 1992, okay? And then she lays out, you know, three you know, different theories for why people might change their narratives. That one, maybe it was actually the truth or maybe there were pressures to change, okay? And so you need to show me that you have read, you know, books and articles that are the highest quality. You know, at least, you know, Sarah So or somebody or even better than her. Okay. That sounds good? Right. Did you buy the book or not yet? Okay. Okay. So my recommendation is I, I think the copy store still has one book left. So it's only 10 bucks. So go today, buy the book spend the entire weekend reading it and then rewrite the essay by Monday. Okay? That sounds good? Okay, thank you. Alright. That's it. No, I mean, these are good papers. It's just uh, what to do and what not to do. Okay? You need to read at least in every. You need to give me at least three sentences per chapter what the author is saying, and then you can give me like fifteen sentences what you think. But I need at least three sentences what the author is saying in that chapter. Okay, so you need to go and buy the Comfort Women, and buy you know and read the book. You know, international students I expect you to read the whole book. Korean students at least half the book, especially chapters two and six. Okay. All right. Okay, those were two good essays. Uh, let me move on. Okay. Did it? Okay. Uh, and then we got a couple. And then we got a couple on North Korea and Europe. Okay, Sean, you want to be? Okay. Come on up. Okay. Um, so what's your what's your main claim? Okay, I have to say that I'm not even that I'm not even that knowledgeable on the subject myself, but I feel I still find it interesting and I found the research interesting. Okay. So um you're welcome to challenge my opinion because it's not like I'm um, an expert or something. Um, Don't say opinion, say claim. My claim. What is your main claim? Okay, I'm not even sure what I'm Okay. Um, so um, well basically 
The author is Paul Krugman, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and um, like he wrote about the he wrote wrote about um, Europe the, the, about Europe and how um, the, how the EU came to be, and he wrote about how the euro came, and then about the recession, and then sure. He That's maybe a, if you want to revise, just give me a simple claim, which is that what is Paul Krugman's what is Krugman's central claim? He's saying that the euro was a good idea or a bad idea for Europe. He said that it's that it might be, that, they, that it might not work and that they might have to let go of it. Well, he said that, you know, it was pr probably a bad idea in the first place. Yeah. Okay? He, he never says that we have to go back. And it's, no, probably, it's probably too late. But he said that, you know, having a common currency in the United States may work, mm -hmm. or it does work, but for reasons one, two, and three, it does not work in Europe. Yeah. Okay? And then I, like, wrote about that I don't think that it's Euro that I think that um, in no other in the, no other place in the world, if there's a recession, people would get the idea to blame the currency of the people. Um, that there's other reasons for why um, there's recession there, and that I think that, for instance, one of the re one of the reasons I think that it's different in the United States and China and Japan, for instance, is because they just print money. That's probably all true, yeah. but again, well, I if they you can print money. Okay. You know, every week I stress that you need to link to the class readings, right? Mm -hmm. So, you need to tell me, like, what is Krugman's, okay, you, you tell me what is main, you told me his main claim, right? Yeah. But then you also need to tell me what his key argument is, right? And then you need to tell me why you agree or disagree with his key argument. Yeah, but he had so many. But he had, like, two or three. That's why you need to read and summarize in three, maybe, like, three or four sentences. You can't, like, because summarize the whole, whole article in three sentences. impossible. No, but right. Let me summarize it to you in mm. three sentences. Okay. Okay. Go. okay. All right. So this is a review session, and you know I love you, right? No. Okay. <laughs> 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 no. Okay. Say it again. I love you. Ah. Okay. <laughs> All right. No way. Really. Okay. Now, three sentences. Improvement. Okay. So first sentence. Plain is that euro is probably not a good idea. Okay, second sentence. A key reason is that in the past, if a country's economy was not good, it sucked, then how can you make your economy more competitive? Let's say you're Greece and you don't sell it and your products are not very competitive, right? Then how can you make your product more competitive? Or, okay, we're in Asia now, so like, you know, Japanese products, Sony, eh, people, are, it's not as good as Samsung, right? So how can you sell Sony products? How can you make Sony more competitive? You need to what? How can you lower the price? The easiest way to lower the price is by devaluing your currency. Do you understand? Because if you, because if you, because one way to lower the price is by cutting the real price. That means you have to cut the real wages of workers. Can you cut workers' wages in by one third in Korea? No, they all like chasa or protest. You know, bad things happen in Korea when you try to fire people or cut their wages. Okay, so politically, it's much easier to what to just devalue your currency, and that is what Japan is doing now. Yeah, they're paying to the. They always pick the. the yeah, yeah. yeah they they right. peg it to the U.S. dollar, and they always like re like like basically whenever it's worth more, they just say okay, it's worth less, and peg it like lower, basically. Right. So that's a quick that's a quick and easy way to sell your things more cheaply. Okay. So less competitive economies, whereas Japan today, or Greece and Spain in Europe, you know, in the old days they could just devalue their currency, right? So that's sentence number two. Okay. Uh, but then. When you have a common currency, if Japan only uses dollars, not yen, can Japan devalue? No, because they don't have yen anymore. But that okay. I I did and write about like I mean okay I didn't go into detail but I did mention that aspect. That okay, so the point is that so that I'm just saying like the sentence number two. Okay, yep, in okay. the past, poor economies, weak economies would devalue their currency. 
And then if you cannot devalue your currency, then you cannot sell your products. Okay? Now the third sentence is that the only way not to do that, okay, is to make your economy is to make European Union like the United States. Which is that you know Nevada doesn't have their own currency, right? But if the economy in Nevada sucks, like it was a few years ago, what can workers in Nevada do? They can just come on, what's next to Nevada? Nobody, nobody <laughs> went to Vegas? Anyway. But you don't like to gamble? So cheap. Anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway. You go, you can go to more, you can go to, you can go to states where, you know, where there's a good job market, where people want, you know, where people need workers. Okay? So a lot of people went from Nevada to Texas. You understand? But, so, so Krugman's point is that you know either you need either you need currency flexibility or you need labor market flexibility. Okay, and United States has labor market flexibility, but how about in Europe? Can we people just jump to like Germany or Spain? But is it as easy as United States? Legally they can, but how about socially and culturally? Krugman said it's more difficult. Right, because there are barriers. Because it's like, you know, because the distance, listen to me, the distance from Nevada to Texas is, is very, is this probably the same as going from like Greece to Germany or Greece to Spain, right? But there is a bigger, like, cultural, linguistic, and social distance, okay? And so it's a much harder for people to go from Greece to, like, I don't know, Spain, and from Greece to Germany or Britain than from Nevada to go to Texas. And so because you lack that labor market flexibility, um, you cannot readjust, okay? So people, so instead of, so all these unemployed workers, instead of going to like other countries, they just remain unemployed in their home states. Okay? Anyway, so that's proven, so those are proven like, you know, like arguments. You can say that in like five sentences, okay? Especially if you use long sentences like Ricardo. Then I can probably say that in one sentence. Yeah. I thought, you know, I love you, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. This is a hard. Okay. Anyway, so that was Krugman's that was Krugman's claim and supporting arguments and evidence. And so a good essay will address that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now you know Krugman. Mm -hmm. And then what do you think? I don't know that, that if, if I'll go through all of that or through all those points, that would not be a one-page essay. That would be a five-page essay. No, no, I, you can actually say all that in five sentences. No, 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 but if I respond to it oh, and write about it, it th then if I want to write everything I think about that, that would be a really long essay. Because there's a lot of claims, there's a lot of arguments that and I, have, I would have a lot to say about it also. Because, like, um, I mean, I understand his point of view. I understand it, but I think that... Um, well, because so Krupen is mainly saying that if you know United, if Europe really wants to be like United States and have a single currency, then you need a really flexible labor market. Okay, that means that people need to be willing to go anywhere where there's a job. Okay, well, do you think that can happen in the immediate future? Not, no, I don't think that can happen in the immediate future. But I don't think it's just. I don't think that that's the only reason why. It, no, I that's not the only reason. But but I, I, that's a big reason. Yeah, but I just, just, I just. Like some things that he said in there, like I wanted to respond to what he said about the recession. Okay. Like I wanted to write about this, and and I just think that it's not. I just don't think it's. I think there's so many more things that come into play than just the currency. Like I understand, but you cannot just say like Truman makes this claim, but I think other claims are more important. Even a link to Truman addresses main claim. Hmm. You understand? Okay, now we're moving to North Korea. Woohoo! Alright, moving on. Alright. So don't fall asleep. Pay attention. This is very important. Okay. Now, uh, okay. We had a. Okay. Miss Yoon. Miss Yang. Yoon. That's you. Okay. Come on up. Are you Miss Yang? Okay. 
got one in here. Who else wrote a banner? No, wasn't, didn't you just send that to me? Not that one. No, this is the one that you sent me. Okay. And then, was there anything? Oh, and also Emily wrote about Palestine. I guess you're being last Emily. Okay, now. Alright, so tell me about religious NGOs in North Korea. Why are they unnecessary? I didn't say they were unnecessary. That's your title! That's not only my title, but what you highlighted, so sure. Oh, okay, That's not sure. necessarily what I was saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying that they are less effective okay. in in what North Korea needs and um, overall, but um, that's fine. Go on. So tell us, what's your main claim? It, um, so my main claim is that religiously funded organizations are still beneficial, yet I feel that they're not necessarily helpful to an overall change in North Korea. Um, and what I based my claim on was sure, the what is your, what is your argument and evidence? the, the tour mm -hmm. that is going on. So North Korea is opening up um, their tourism, and they even opened up um, a tourism website for their country, which is very interesting if you actually go on there. Um, <laughs> and uh, and they have come together this summer with. Um, a religiously funded organization and like a surfing um, NGO mm -hmm. to create a surf camp in the summer in North Korea and so a couple of the foreigners um, participated to teach surfing to North Koreans and this actually happened for four days and five nights um, right and did, were you here when the, when the guest speaker yes uh, okay right. so is it the same NGO or is it different NGO? I, it, it's um, and my argument is that although um, opening up tourism and um, and these NGOs helping this um, flowing well, like all these foreigners going into North Korea is in a way beneficial because this is uh, another way for North Korea to open up to Western culture and. Um, Western culture and uh, perhaps reduce like anti-American sentiments because a lot of uh, some of the participants were actually Americans and uh, one of the non-profit organizations the Surfing the Nation organization is actually American too and so this in a way could be beneficial however is this I ask the question is this necessary obviously the people who participated in this um, surfing camp were these North Koreans were a lot more wealthy, obviously are not, you know, dealing with human rights violations in their uh, in um, that, that other people face. They're not the average civilians in North Korea, um, whereas other people who live in the concentration camps or who are living in poverty and are starving are not getting these opportunities. And this isn't necessarily what they need. And so. So what do they need? They, they should. So they should. They should, they, instead of surfing tourism, NGOs should be doing things like what? They should be giving things like... Well, they should be um, aiding in food or somehow working with the government to, ch um, uh, to you know, allocate more resources for these people who are lacking in them. Um, and this is, uh, and these kind of work, uh, organizations like Mercy Corps or Red Cross are doing. Um, however, they're having a lot more difficult time than religious organizations because, as Snyder um, uh, argued, religious organizations have a better uh, relationship with the government because they try to keep a positive uh, relationship with them, whereas other um, big organizations with you know, a hierarchy, with bureaucracy, have a difficult time because they have a set agenda that they want to get across, but because of the hostility of the North Korean government, it's a lot difficult for them to, uh, to do their work. That's fine. Uh, Snyder actually talks about two reasons. One is not just uh, not just that it's difficult to work in North Korea, mm -hmm. but what happened in the early 90s, do you remember? Mm -hmm. 
no, well, because of the famine, you had many NGOs coming to North Korea, right? But after a few years, only the religious NGOs stayed, right? It wasn't because of the fa- it wasn't because Well, yes, because they were mo- motivated religiously. No, right, but, but why did a lot of the secular NGOs leave? What was that big event? Do you remember? You had the atomic bomb, okay? And then after the atomic bomb, U.S. and other countries imposed sanctions, and they cut off all funding to NGOs in North Korea. And so that was actually the, so it wasn't just, the point is that, you know, government, North Korean government restrictions were always there, okay? But what changed was that the Western funding was cut off. And because the Western funding was cut off, only NGOs that could get their own funding could stay. And for the most part, these were the religious NGOs, okay? Just a minor clar- clarification. Now, my main feedback, did you see my feedback? Yes. So I said, Good essay. I gave you an A minus. Okay. Woo! Aren't you proud? It's a, I said good discussion. Okay. Uh, you link it to like a lot of different sources. Now, but you can develop a stronger counter argument, which is that food, medicine, and other critical supplies they provide immediate relief, but not necessarily long term economic development. Okay. So poor nations, you know, you don't. And if you just give them food, they just become dependent on a foreign aid, right? So what can poor nations do to develop their economy, to get foreign currency? They can do things like what? Tourism. Yeah, tourism. Well, hopefully in the, in the distant future, they can do it another time soon, right? Uh, but for now, the one of the biggest growth areas these days is tourism, right? And, you know, and surfing tourism is one example. Do you think that's a good, that's a good way to develop their economy? I think it's a good start, and okay. it's definitely obvious that they're trying to get um, more government income into the country, and that will thus generate some sort of like economy and open more doors in the end. So I don't condemn them of like doing this. I don't think it's a bad idea, mm-hmm. um, and that's why I said although beneficial, it would be more. Uh, or, uh, it would be better to see religious NGOs doing a little bit more work that would uh, help the actual civilians that are in immediate need than those who are wealthy. That's fine. I was just pushing you, okay? Because a lot of people think, oh, we should focus on immediate need. But actually, development experts, they actually argue that, you know, that kind of creates dependency. So it's actually better to both do immediate need, but also think about you know long-term development. Okay. Anyway, but you know I, you know I like you, right? Okay. Sure. All right. Great. <laughs> that. All right. Okay. Yay. Okay. So, so don't make fun of those surfers. Okay. They may be the moon for North Korea. So it's like you know, maybe surfing today and then. You know, Samsung, to, uh, you know, North Korean version of Samsung tomorrow. <laughs> and then hopefully third stage will be democracy. We'll see. All right. One step at a time. Okay. All right, Emily, come on up. All right, tell me about Israel-Palestine. Yeah. Happy or sad? The conflict? Yes. Happy. Happy. Okay. Uh, sad, of sad. course. Sad. Very sad. Conflict. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your name? So t- tell us about your paper. What's your name, please? Yeah. Um, I was. Yeah. Uh, I, I talked about the boycotting of Israel. If that's a good or bad idea, and I was linking to you know Philip's paper that I read about when they compared the South African boycott, uh, boycott of South Africa when they um, uh, to not support uh, party. That's fine. Anyway, so. Y- you studied this one Swedish professor, right? Yes. What's his name? Uh, uh, Bjerled. Bjerled? Okay. That's not even a Swedish name, but... Okay. Um, and he, he, had a, he had a main claim, right? Yeah, he had a main claim that's about that to... Uh, how to summarize that? Yes, both the parties in the conflict look at each uh, their self as the weaker part of the right. conflict. And I think that was very interesting, and I think that's kind of the key to the concept. Like, Israel or Palestine first, they view themselves as occupied and that's a nation conflict about their country that the Israelis are occupying. And then that makes them the weaker state, of course. Right, so we're the weak victim. 
and Israel is yeah. a powerful oppressor. Yes. Okay? And Israel. And Israeli thinks, no, I'm the victim. Yes. And the, who's the oppressor? All the Arab world. All of the other Arab countries, right. basically. Arabs in the past, and now today they think it's Arabs plus West. Yes, the whole world is against us. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So I wrote that, I last we talked about maybe boycotting isn't the best idea in this case because it could make Israel even more willing to occupy even more areas because they feel so uh, pushed back from all the world and maybe make themselves even stronger. Um, well, so yeah. You make the right wing nationalists stronger. Oh, wait, yeah. Wait. Oh, okay, okay. Or like, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Or no, no, more like the nat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like the national. That's fine. So, what is your solution? Uh, I don't really have a solution. Wish I had. Uh, but I think I also again I uh, use Sweden as an um, example, where they have um, recognized uh, Palestine as a state, and I think that's a very good way of saying that they have the right to exist and Israel have the right to exist. They should cooperate. Mm -hmm. And also that there is an ongoing campaign in Sweden. I'm not, I don't know how big it is right though, but it's called like uh, mark the occupation. Like you are not supposed to buy, you're supposed to mark the things that are from the occupied areas, not from Israel itself. And I think that's good because it, it shows it's a way of showing that we respect you as a country. We think that Israel should be able to exist, but we don't think that you should occupy Palestine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, you know I like you too, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Peace be, peace be with you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm not gay. Anyway. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, but I want to push Emily a little bit. One is that... Um, you know, Sweden was the first, one of the first states, maybe the first state to recognize Palestine, right? In Europe. In Europe, okay. Now, why are the Israelis so worried about, you know, recognition? It's not just because they're getting, like, you know, the rec it's not just because they want them to be equal, but they think that recognition might lead to what? Um, Do you know? Hamas would attack it's not just Hamas, but they're really worried that an independent Palestinian state can accuse Israel bring them to the ICC, oh, yeah. the International Criminal Court, okay? And then, do the, you understand? It's kind of like, we don't want to be like North Korea, okay? And because they're afraid that ICC will not be fair, that it's gonna be a bunch of like Western liberals, and they're always gonna vote in favor of the Palestinians. Do you understand? Yeah. So there's a very strong concern that we're gonna be, we're gonna be another North Korea. So that's, again, so they're thinking of themselves as a victim, as versus the ICC. Okay, and then number two, uh, yes? Are you talking about Israel? Yeah. Oh, I think. If I think that? Oh, do you? I don't know, but you're, uh, according to this professor and a lot of other scholars, they do. But and if you're, if you're asking the Israelis, they clearly feel they're the weaker party, right? I mean, so if you, like, if you, talk, if you look at any like, majority survey, or just look at Netanyahu's like statements, public speeches. It's always like, we're the victim, we're the victim, right? It's always like, you know, I, I don't think any, I don't think I'll, okay, anyway, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm a little bit surprised about that because like um, recently I met some Israeli people like separately. Um, and so I also talked with them about this and it's um, not really like um, a friend who went there. So it's not, what the perspective that I got like it's not really like uh, like people are b basically blaming them like you are pretending like it's a victim um, the I think that's a little bit like overruled it's not that they're saying it's a vi they, they are the victim but like the way they're acting uh, it's resulting in that they how do you say that act like they're the victim. <laughs> um, I want to, um, I think it's a little bit too much to, to say that uh, apparently like in school it, it, it turns out that they are the victim, but I don't think they um, are thinking it literally like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, it's not that they are the victim, it's like, uh, and they pretend like that. It's yeah. just... Yeah, uh, but I think, I know, if you look at like the Gaza conflict from the summer, it started as, because they think that Palestine I don't think that. 
they think that Palestine wants to attack them. They think that if Palestine would be recognized, they would attack Israel. And of course, that makes them very like scared. And it's like I don't remember what it that they fired one shot or something, and then the Gaza. I don't really remember. Well, the Gaza Strip was Hamas versus Israel. But it was something about. <laughs> I don't get it. How can you not recognize the country that always existed? Palestine was there before Israel. Israel is a creative country by the Western country. You know, basically, they took away the land from the Palestine and they gave it to the Israelis. Oh, we're free and still. Why, why are you giving, me away, giving away my land? No, that's why I'm giving away my land. Netanyahu, yeah. But this is not, I don't think this is actually about fact. This is more about how you feel. Like, I think it's very, like. You can't feel alone when you've got a battle of strong countries. You just have, like, the US. They don't have that much like spoken out support, I think. That might be right, but again, in this class we talk a lot about in this class we talk a lot about competing narratives, right? Like you know, I see the world one way, but then you see the world another way, right? And then the question is, how do you bridge that? Okay? And I think maybe like maybe I can push push your paper. Like remember we talked about the bridging dialogue yeah. in the other class. And then I think maybe in this case you need institutions where people like like Ian Phillips argues that you need to build like relations of trust. They need to like understand each other, get to know each other. Okay. And so, for example, in South Africa, you had these like multi-day retreats where leaders can come and get to know each other. Okay. And also at a more fundamental, also at a more fundamental level, key leaders of the key leaders of the Af of the ANC, including Nelson Mandela, they went to. They went to like these, like these uh, British schools, boarding schools. Okay, so they had like you know, so they had like these kind of personal ties and mutual understanding between you know these different people because they went to the same schools. And now in Israel, you have some people who are trying to build that. So you, there, I think there's this really famous uh, one university. It's like the MIT of Israel. Okay, and they have these online classes, and then a lot of Arab students and Palestinian students are taking these classes. Because you know, it's online, it's anonymous, okay? And so they're kind of like, and so they're kind of building this kind of bridging dialogue. They have something in common, which is you know, math and science, okay? So you know, maybe that maybe that can be yeah. a start. But right? like, just one very like important thing here is when you talk about a whole nation and country. I also talk to a lot of Israel and Palestinians. I don't say that all of the Israeli people think that they're victims. There's so many people in Israel that are like, hey, we're the oppressors, stop this. You're talking about uh, the government. Like uh, in Sweden, there's so many who doesn't agree to uh, uh, recognize Palestine as a state. But Sweden, you say that Sweden does it, but the government, like, that's clear, right? So <laughs> it's not about that I think that all of the Israelis think that they're victims. I think that the government thinking that. They're acting in that kind of way. I think that's right. Actually, like, probably if you ask Palestinians if they're a victim, maybe like 90% will say yes. Okay? Yeah. Whereas if you ask the same question in Israel, Israelis are very divided. Okay? Yeah. Uh, that actually kind of links really well to the Japan case. Who read the Asahi Shimbum article? The New York Times? Okay? And so, right now, like, his. Historically, Japan was very divided on, the, on what to do about the comfort women issue, right? And then you had a lot of liberal newspapers, li liberal politicians, such as Asahi Shimba, and they pushed for this kind of bridging, okay, reconciliation, okay? Uh, but, you know, but Asahi made a mistake, okay? Remember, we talked about this, right? That maybe they were trying to do a little bit too much, so they you know, so they reported all these claims without investigating, okay? And one of their claims was later proven to be false, like Yoshida, okay, kidnapping. 
and then later Asahi Shimbun said, okay, we reinvestigated and we found no evidence that anyone was kidnapped, okay? And because one of their claims was discredited, now people are saying, now people are discrediting all their claims. And then you're having like Japanese versions of Ilbe <laughs> who are like attacking the liberals, okay? And so you have to think about what can we do to help liberals, whether in Israel, like the Labor Party, or the liberals in Japan, in the Asahi, right? And then, you know, for example, like Asahi Shimbo, they came out and said that, you know, if you really want to help us, we should get rid of the comfort women statues. Because it's a comfort, it's like, you know, because it's one of those things that really made, like, you know, the Japanese Ilbe people very angry. Because they think it dishonors Japan. Okay? And so, that is, and so, you know, it's, so you can, you know, if, you know, if you do an, like an extra credit summary, you can, you know, you can summarize what they said and then tell me if you agree or disagree. You know, do you think that, you know, if you want to help liberals in Japan, is it better to have more and more comfort women statues or is it better to get rid of them? Do you say? So who says it's better to have statues? Who says it's better not to have statues? No. <laughs> not to have statues? Okay, who's like not sure? Okay, all right. <laughs> but the point is, I just want you to understand the claims made by different actors, okay? So the claim made by pro-comfort women is that this raises consciousness, public pressure in Japan, okay? But the claim made by Asahi is that, you know, if you, the more comfort women statues you have, the more Japanese people feel like they're victims. And when Japanese people feel like victims, then it's very difficult to have this kind of liberal discourse. And so like, like so the liberals in Israel, you know, they, they really, you know, they, can, they don't like it when Israel is like boycotted or when they get rockets, okay? Because then the discourse is like, we're victims, we should never compromise with Palestinians, okay? And so you have to think about what can we do to strengthen, you know, liberals in Israel, okay? So maybe, okay, so maybe you can have a dialogue. And then, you know, if you ever come and visit, bring like a liberal Israeli. <laughs> and then we can ask him or her, how can we help you yeah. win the next election? Okay? Or we can, you know, bring some liberal Japanese and then ask him, how can we help you, Asahi Shimbo? You know, uh, regain political power in Japan. I just okay. want to add, like, Ross, like, I just want to add that I think that you're totally right. Like, with the country and stuff, I just, because that is such an, no, I know, I know, I know. It's just that I do. I just, that problem, like when I was in Israel and Palestine, I realized that that is one of the uh, key arguments from both both sides. Like the Israelis are like, here, look, here's 4,000 years ago where we were first. And then they're like, no, this is 3,999 years where we were first. So I think that, yeah. It's, like it's a very, like, both sides can make that argument, even if one side is, like, more right. So, yeah, it's everything about this conflict is just... It's just for me, like, I think we're in the Yeah, country. of course. I, I, I know, like, what it can be like to do yeah. something like that, because for my country, it's the same. It, it, it used to exist, but they took it away. And yeah. now, you know, we're getting it back anymore. Yeah, you know, it's I know. Like, and I think like it's a valid argument, say. yeah. And it's more like you should maybe think about those people who are living in the nearest history. I'm just saying that when I was there, there was I almost started laughing. I was like, but hey, calm down. So, but yeah. Anyway, we need to move on. So we're gonna have our last team meeting, okay? Because it's very important that you talk to each other and understand each other. Because we're doing, you have to summarize how many students.